Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hanning Liang. I'm currently the head of the Department of Computing, which is one of the five uh, departments within the School of Advanced Technology. So today I'm going to briefly talk about the school, some information about uh, the programs we offer, uh, briefly describe basically the facilities we have in terms of research and teaching, and then give you an overview and the reasons why you should come and join us. The School of uh, Advanced Technology is located in North Campus of our Sujo campus. It expands across four uh, blocks, houses, researchers, professors and students, and the aim of the school is to create an environment where research-led takes place, where teaching-oriented happens. Our faculty and students are quite committed to providing the best environment for good teaching practice to happen and also the main goal of uh, the school is to basically allow students to untap and unlock their potential to become what they want to become in the future. So the school was established in 2019 and brings together five departments from the original two departments, which were the uh, founding departments of the university. So currently the five departments are intelligence science, computing, electrical and electronic engineering, mechatronics and robotics, and finally uh, communications and networking. We have currently seven undergraduate programs together with nine uh, postgraduate programs. And then in addition to that, we have a very active and very vibrant community of PhD students who are doing their PhD degrees. Uh, on this occasion, I won't be able to go in detail about our programs. Our programs are quite popular, especially at the undergraduate level. So currently our uh, seven programs houses more than 3,000 students and our nine uh, postgraduate programs houses more than 250 master students, uh, together with more than 80 PhD students. So we have a very vibrant community of uh, students and uh, staff who are actually committed, as I said earlier, to have world-class research and also to establish and provide world-class teaching to our students. In terms of research facilities, we have a number of research centers and also a number of research institutes. We have a lot of advanced equipment that are used to provide the teaching facilities that we aim to, uh, to give to our students. We have, for example, uh, labs for sustainable energy research. We have uh, a clean room for micro nano manufacturing. We have a center for uh, energy and power research. We have uh, different labs for uh, electronics teaching. Uh, and then we have also uh, dedicated labs for um, uh, teaching hands-on and practical uh, modules. In terms of our staff, our staff are quite international. Uh, we come from uh, basically everywhere. Uh, UK, Italy, Canada, Korea, Romania, uh, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. We are very active, as I said earlier, in research. And actually, our staff members publish in very top uh, journals and conferences in the areas. Uh, we attract a very large amount of funding every year. Um, our school uh, is one of the most research active uh, units within our university. Um, so we have been able to uh, attract actually quite a lot of funding and also attract uh, staff and students who are doing world-class research. We have also been awarded different types of teaching uh, prizes uh, at the provincial and also at the uh, city levels. In terms of research, our staff members have uh, published books in the editorial board of leading journals and so on and so forth. We have collaborations with different industrial partners and also universities outside of China. In terms of our graduates, nearly 30% of our students achieve a first class degree. Uh, nearly 80% will go and seek further studies abroad. 20% go to world-class top 10 universities, and more than 65% will go to top 100 universities. Um, actually, there's a growing trend of our students going to very top universities, and at the same time, obtaining scholarships uh, that will cover the tuition and other uh, types of stipends that are given to them uh, while they're studying. So we're doing quite well in terms of uh, allowing and supporting our students to go further in terms of their studies and in terms of going to uh, some of the leading universities uh, to do their master's degree. Uh, in recent years, actually, some of our students have gone on to do 
uh, PhDs with full scholarships. For example, one of my students uh, have gone recently to the University of Melbourne with a full scholarship directly from his uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, I had another student who went to uh, Virginia Tech and is doing his PhD with a world-leading researcher. And again, he also got a scholarship and that would cover his PhD tuitions. And also he receives a, a relatively okay stipend you know, for his living. Basically, you can see a list of uh, universities that students go to. In this list, you can see Cambridge, Oxford, uh, Imperial College. Uh, so these are the universities in the UK. In terms of the universities in uh, North America, the, you can see uh, Southern California, uh, Harvard. Um, one of our students got a, have gotten accepted recently into Brown University with uh, a partial scholarship. Uh, and then we have some students, of course, going to Australia. Um, so the list is quite varied, but uh, I think there's a trend that you can see, uh, and this trend is that uh, the, our students are going to actually go to better and better universities. So this is a good thing for us, and this is a very good thing for our students, which is actually uh, our primary focus, to give them the best chance uh, to go to the best place they, can, uh, they want to. Some students uh, have gone on to industry straight. Some of our graduates have gone to leading uh, companies like Huawei, uh, Nintendo, Lenovo, Street Trip, and so on and so forth. And they're doing quite well in their respective jobs. Uh, we hear quite frequently from them, and we're actually quite proud uh, that they are still uh, doing very well uh, you know, even after uh, leaving us. Here are some basically uh, stories of students who have gone on to do quite well uh, after graduating from university. Um, so uh, in this slide, you have students who have gone to uh, Cambridge and one who have gone to Imperial College. Another, another student from uh, the Triple E department have gone to Harvard University. Another one here who have gone to Oxford. The one on my right have gone to uh, Cambridge with a full scholarship. So the one in the middle, actually, he was my student, uh, and I mentioned him earlier. He has gone to Virginia Tech, and he's doing his uh, PhD with a world-leading researcher. And finally, a few more uh, students have gone on to do well uh, after they graduated from our school. So on this occasion, i like to talk about something that uh, we do within our department and also within our school, um, and this is about teaching. For me, teaching actually is about developing an environment and a platform for students to self-learn so that they can actually become what they want to become. So today I'm going to talk about using teaching as a platform for self-motivated learners and also self-directed learning. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to present a case study of a module that I have developed and I have delivered for the last six years. So basically, this is a summary of my presentation. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, research-led teaching and learning because that is the guiding framework for how teaching takes place within our university. I'm going to talk briefly about motivational theories because uh, they actually serve as an additional framework for how I design the modules that I uh, teach. As I mentioned earlier, I will use one of the modules that I, uh, I currently teach as a case study to show what can be achieved by using these two frameworks. Uh, and at the end, I'll show you some projects of students who have gone through uh, this module. So this is me, basically. I wanted to show the type of teachers we have here, the, the type of staff that we attract. So the type of staff that we attract is actually quite international. They have a lot of experience overseas, and uh, they have come to China to join the university. So in my case, I finished my two degrees in Canada and uh, I had some teaching experience in Canada uh, as well as uh, Australia before coming to XJTLU in 2012. Uh, like many, many staff members and teachers uh, within our university, we are actually award-winning researchers and award-winning teachers. Uh, you can see this actually from the profile of some of the teachers in our university. This is the thing that I like to talk about, uh, and this is the first part of the presentation, which is research-led teaching. Uh, you may have actually saw this, uh, seen this in a website uh, that actually uh, the guiding framework for our teaching is uh, research-led teaching. So this is one of the definitions that I found uh, in the literature and actually quite descriptive of what research-led teaching is. Uh, so for these uh, researchers, uh, research-led teaching reflects and makes use of the teacher's 
actually research to benefit student learning and outcomes. So in that sense, research-led teaching is actually about how we can fit our research into our teaching. Uh, now, if we can expand this concept, for me, uh, research-led teaching is also about how teaching can fit back into our research. So the two combined will have this dialectic between research and teaching. Okay. So in, in that sense, uh, research and teaching becomes two sides of the same coin. So this is my own definition of research-led teaching, and this is the framework that I apply when I'm designing and delivering modules that I actually teach at this university. So in terms of uh, some examples of how we can apply research-led teaching, uh, basically in the context of uh, fitting our research to, te to teaching, we try, or I try, to have learning and research activities uh, that are embedded within the module, but also the need of the students. So we have different types of activities like group projects, uh, and also we have, uh, I give students hands-on activities that can actually help them develop their skills in terms of research and in terms of developing applications that can lead to research activities. Uh, in terms of fitting our research, uh, sorry, our teaching to research, uh, basically what I try to do is to develop curriculum and content that can promote and enhance my research. Okay. So to a large extent, uh, the ideal situation is for some of the students' work uh, to become part of uh, research projects. And I've been able to do this quite successfully. And I'll show you some examples later of some of uh, some papers that have come up from students who have taken the modules that I teach. Uh, and we have been able to actually publish them in quite reasonably good places. So now, I've talked about research-led teaching. But at the same time, one can also think about research-led learning to a certain degree there are two sides of the same coin as well. So in terms of research-led teaching, that happens, it's an activity that takes place uh, from the perspective of uh, the teachers. Right? On the other hand, you have research learning, which can actually be promoted uh, to the students. And so when these two are combined, you can have motivated students, but also motivated teachers uh, who enjoy doing teaching and at the same time enjoy doing research. So at the end, you end up having active and engaged learners and researchers uh, or teachers. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is about motivation. Uh, the reason why I think this is useful is because motivation is a fundamental idea. And that is the, uh, basically the reason why people do certain actions. They have certain desires and certain needs. Uh, it's what causes or encourages people to repeat a behavior. Now, there are two types of at least uh, two types of motivation. One comes from external from the individual, and the other one comes from inside the individual. So ideally, we should actually have both of these uh, motivational factors within a structure that we give to students. And uh, as long as students can master motivation, then they will have a sustained and deliberate practice to do things. And this things can be learning, um, can be in terms of sports, can be in other things that they do. Now, the next question that one might have is how we can actually help students master motivation. So one of the, uh, the things that we can do is try to get them into this idea of flow. The idea of flow is actually well researched in, uh, by researchers. Uh, uh, basically, flow is a mental state in which a person is performing activity with a lot of focus, a lot of energy, a lot of involvement, and a lot of enjoyment. So essentially, they like doing something, they cannot stop doing the thing, and uh, they have a lot of energy into you know, this particular activity. And you can see this in different things, in sports, uh, in playing games, in coding, in uh, learning something new. So if you're able to apply this and try to help our students, and actually ourselves, to move along this flow concept, then we achieve quite positive outcomes. So the idea of flow is that you have two things uh, that come into play. One is, on the one hand, skills, and the other thing is uh, challenge. So the idea is to balance the two. Uh, balance the skill that you need to do certain activity, but also try to uh, increasingly give more challenge to that activity. So when the two becomes balanced, when challenge and skill becomes balanced, then the person who's doing this activity 
experience this flow, uh, basically this uh, flow ex experience. Okay. And this can be applied to learners and as, as well as teachers. So this is one of the uh, frameworks that is quite useful uh, for me in terms of framing the uh, teaching activities that happens within the modules that I teach. I'm going to talk about the uh, case study um, and uh, go through some examples of uh, the things that the students in this module have done. This module is about actually teach computer games. In particular, teach uh, students how to design and how to develop computer games. As you know, computer games are quite pervasive in society. And on the other hand, because of this pervasiveness of computer games, there's a large uh, job market for those who, are, who have the skills to develop games. Uh, incidentally, actually, if you are in the uh, Asia-Pacific area, the growth of computer games is the biggest in this area. And this trend will continue. So it's actually a very uh, practical and very uh, important topic in this time and in this area. So in terms of the actual content of this module, students learn programming, students learn design principles, and to a certain degree, some arts uh, elements. Uh, they have individual and teamwork activities, and uh, basically the, uh, the students are introduced to different aspects of games, gameplay mechanics, design principles of games, and more importantly, uh, they learn also some practical skills uh, and practical tools like Unity 3D and also C Sharp. So students have a, get a good balance between theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge, and uh, uh, this you know, can be seen in the thing in the uh, games that they develop at the end of the module, which i show you some later on. So uh, this module started in 2013 and 2014 with uh, students from two programs, and then it expanded to uh, include students from a third program, and then later on, uh, from last year, it expanded to include uh, also master students. So in terms of student numbers, the uh, module has been growing quite fast uh, from the original 20 students to uh, current, the current year uh, to about 85 students. And next year, the expected number of students will be 150, so nearly 40% more uh, uh, from the current year. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is a very applied and practical course. Students learn theory and also uh, they gain practical skills. Okay. Uh, so they uh, learn lectures, uh, theoretical knowledge, and in the labs and tutorials, they gain practical knowledge. Okay? And they also work uh, together with uh, other students in teams. So the assessments are quite actually well designed and uh, it has, they have a combination of individual and group work. In terms of research learning, students actually within an environment where recent theories are discussed and also uh, recent research and commercial developments are discussed and shown to them. So they actually go on to work on producing something practical, something that is quite tangible, uh, something that they can see and uh, show to other students. And uh, they need to also do some research and development uh, activities within the module. So they need to explore what has been done, and also they need to learn some new techniques uh, and new technologies that they can actually use uh, and they have access to. Students engage with both individual and group learning. Okay. And this is actually quite aligned in terms of how the environment in industry works. Um, and that's why we want to actually encourage and uh, allow this to take place you know, within the school environment. So in terms of research-led teaching, I have students uh, from different group, uh, different levels. So uh, you know, the, in, the, in the module, you see a combination of undergraduate and master students, and sometimes PhD students who would like to sit in the class and learn something new. And that actually combination is quite useful for all students involved because they can share uh, what they know, uh, they can actually share their experiences, uh, and also they can actually motivate each other to learn new things. I actually include the latest research developments because uh, my research area is in games and also new technologies. We try to get the latest uh, equipment so that the students can actually have access and they can interact with them and so that uh, once they go out, go out and let's say they go and work for a company, they will be, you know, they have a good knowledge of these technologies. Some students actually continue to work in my lab, in my research group, 
and we were able to actually you know, produce publications in very good places. And some students go on and they either go to industry or they go on to do other things. So in this case, I have two pictures of two groups of students who have gone on to uh, competitions uh, and uh, they have done quite well. So in terms of the application of the form model to this module, you have uh, lecturers and labs that increasingly try to uh, give them the skills that they need to do the things that uh, they have to do in the module. At the same time, when they do the assignments, uh, the challenge get increasingly more difficult. So assignment one uh, and assignment two, and then the, fin the final thing is the group project. So along the way, they get the skills that they need uh, in the lectures and the, in the labs, and then when they do the, the assignments, they apply the knowledge that they do. So these two will go along, you know, the skills that they gain, and also the challenges they will be given uh, in the context of the assignments and the group projects. I'll show some examples of uh, some of the projects that uh, the students have done. So this is one of the assignments that uh, students get. This is the first assignment, uh, typically, or the second assignment. And in this assignment, they have to create a 2D game. So in this video, the students have to develop a game, a 2D game, that allows the players to move different objects and align them properly. So if the objects are aligned properly, then certain things will happen. So this is actually a very good uh, project to start off uh, for the students so that they can actually apply the things that they learn in terms of uh, uh, design principles and also in terms of uh, using Unity and also C Sharp to develop this game. And then uh, for the group project, they have different components. Uh, so the first component is about uh, the idea. It's about uh, proposing the game that they want to design. And then in the second component, they have to actually uh, basically add more detail to their ideas and they have to prepare a design document. In this design document they have to give more concrete details as to what kind of game they want to make and uh, what kind of principles they're going to use. And finally, the third stage is actually to develop this game. So because this is a good project, typically the expectations are higher than the individual assignments. So there are some pictures and videos of some of the games that students have developed. So this is a uh, what the students call the Viking race. Uh, this is actually a 2D game and uh, involves two players uh, you know, driving a Viking type of vehicle along a particular pathway. And then uh, now they have to face different obstacles along the way. Uh, so this is one game, uh, one example of projects. And this is another one. Uh, this is a table simulation of a board game. Maybe some of you have played this game. And so it's actually quite interesting. Uh, in this particular project, the students have to use some physics uh, mechanics that they have to apply to the game and to the objects uh, within the game. This group in particular was so motivated that they actually created a second game. Uh, this second game and it's about an implementation of a chess game. So I can play the video a little bit here yeah, and you can see how it works. Yeah, so you can move the pieces and as you can see, the pieces actually follow uh, physical laws. You know. So you can see the video here. You know. uh, this is one video of one of the mazes they develop. And you can see how the ball moves along a particular pathway. And uh, in this case, the players have to avoid uh, making the ball fall uh, off the, uh, uh, the maze. Along the video, you can see another maze. And that maze is actually more complex than the one that you saw earlier. The next game is actually quite interesting. It's called Rotating Maze, and it's a 3D game. Uh, and in this 3D game, the player has to rotate objects that are put together to compose a maze. Okay. And the idea is that you have to rotate this maze in a particular way to move the balls along a particular pathway without letting this ball fall uh, off from the maze. It's actually a very interesting game, and the students actually enjoy it quite a lot developing this game. For me, this is actually a good example of uh, having a good theoretical knowledge and apply this theoretical knowledge into something that is quite tangible that the students can see. And then the last game that I'm going to show you is this one. It's called VR Home. It's actually a very interesting game and it's actually quite uh, involved. So in this game, basically you have a small little boy and this boy will go to different environments. Um, so one environment is their home. Basically, uh, the idea is for 
the uh, player to guide this boy to do certain activities so that he can master these activities. So in the home, he can learn how to put different puzzles together, 3D puzzles using different blocks, uh, 3D blocks. Then he can go to a different environment. You know, here is a picture of different environments. So this is the, uh, the beach environment where um, one has to show uh, this boy how to behave and what can be done in the beach environment. And then this is the space environment where one has to guide basically the boy along different objects and experience different types of gravity. So finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that actually is good for both students and uh, you know, uh, teachers like myself is to involve students in research projects. So this student, for example, uh, Tiffan, who graduated last year and is now doing his PhD at Melbourne University with full scholarship, uh, published a number of papers uh, with me before he graduated. So some of these papers are basically quite top. Here's you know, one, two, and uh, another two more papers we published before uh, he went to Australia to continue his PhD. Basically, uh, the way we teach here, the way we approach teaching is actually uh, maybe slightly different from the traditional conception of teaching. For us, teaching is not simply feeding the students something that they learn. Teaching is about developing the environment and giving students the right framework and platform so that they become self-motivated and also they can somehow self-direct their learning. Uh, and when that happens, actually students enjoy it very much uh, and they can actually learn quite a lot. Uh, at the same time, they can produce things of quite good quality, both in terms of practical things that they can see, like in this case, games, but it doesn't have to be games, it can be other things that they can do, you know, different types of applications for mobile phones or mobile devices. And at the same time, the right environment is given to students. They can actually do other things like performing top level research projects. If you have any questions, you can actually email us uh, to this email and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much.